name is Greg Leverati. I'm Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Baruch College. So happy to have you here with us this evening. I am Zooming from Queens. Please uh, feel free to put in the chat where you are Zooming from. We've, uh, it's been great to see our alumni joining us from all over the country, even all over the world at all of these events. Uh, so it'd be great to know where, where everyone else is from. Uh, we're delighted to, uh, to have another event this evening uh, that's career focused. Uh, and just a few quick ground rules. We will be recording tonight's event, so if you miss anything, you will be able to take a look back, uh, so don't feel like you have to necessarily take feverish notes. Um, earlier today, I did email you out a worksheet that's helpful to fill out during this event and also after the event. I'm going to put a link in the chat if you'd like to um, download that worksheet again in case you haven't gotten it yet, so feel free to click the link I just put in the chat, uh, which will let you get that worksheet. Um, you can leave your video on. We do like to see our alumni smiling faces, but please turn your microphones off so that we don't have any ambient noise to distract from our speaker. Uh, and please direct your questions to the chat bar. We will be monitoring it throughout the event and we'll have time at the end of the event to address all of our questions, as many as we can. Uh, speaking of our speaker, I will now briefly introduce Dr. Nyla Bari. Dr. Nyla Bari spent nearly 15 years as Dean of Students at Columbia Business School, where she coached, taught, and advised thousands of students. She's led learning and development for a global medical diagnostics company, and today facilitates coaching and leadership for clients like American Express, Jane Street Capital, RBC Capital Markets, and many more. So without further ado, I'd now like to introduce Nyla Bari. Nyla? Thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here, and it's Always a pleasure to talk to other business school alumni. Um, for me, I'm a little further uptown, but it's always nice to hear what's going on in the hearts, minds, and careers of other people who come from the world I spent so much of my time in. Um, I would love the chat to be active. So even I see that you guys are telling me where you are located. I'd love to know what brings you to a conversation about uh, stamina, professional stamina, career stamina. So I'm just also this way, because we're a relatively small group, I can do a little bit of customizing about what we spend more time on. Um, I want to talk to you about some of the research that's informed how I think about developing career stamina. Some of the things that you guys can do now during times like we're living through unpredictable wild times, but also all the time to maintain a sense of relevance and urgency and freshness in your career. So I know that uh, business school grads often have career front of mind, but I'd love some specifics. Um, I'd love to know what brings you to this kind of session. So um, if you could throw that in the chat, I'd love to see it. What I'm gonna do is walk you through a framework of activity and thinking, ideas that come out of the research that I've conducted. Before I do that, I'll share with you a little bit of the framework that I use to think about career development first and foremost and overall. I'll say this, so I did spend uh, nearly 20 years at Columbia Business School. So I was the Dean of Students, I was on the faculty, I created the Leadership Center that we have there. I still do a fair amount of work for them. I still teach um, elsewhere at Columbia, I teach at the School of Public Health quite a bit. I spent a lot of time in companies and nonprofits and startups. Um, helping leaders become more effective as a leadership coach, but also helping them figure out their career goals and aspirations. And I come at that not just because I spent so much time in higher ed in a business school, but because I did research for my dissertation around layoff. And the subject that kind of drew me into thinking about that was try to understand more about why during difficult times, some people come out of workplace trauma, disruption, difficult moments differently than others. And I think if you think about your own career and you think about the people around you, you know that there are some people who get laid off and seem to bounce back quite quickly. There are some people who get laid off or have are overlooked for a promotion or marginalized because of a restructure who are paralyzed. And it takes them years to recover. And I wanted to understand what made those people different. Uh, the good news is that what I largely found was that the things that make people different in their stamina of recovery place disruption is behavioral. I had had the impression, I had the hypothesis, this would have a lot to do with positivity, a happiness set point, our natural instinct towards the glass half full or glass half empty. And what I found was that, to much to my relief, I have to add, is that largely what differentiated people's outcomes is what they did. And sometimes they got there with positivity and sometimes they went there kicking and screaming, but because a coach, a partner, an old boss gave them behaviors to try, 
things worked out for them. Um, as we go on, I'll be showing you ideas that come from the research, but I want this to be practical and grounded. Greg mentioned that there is a worksheet that I've attached for you guys. It's in the chat. You may have gotten it earlier. It is, this is the work that we do with our minds and our hands and we can do it now. We can do it tonight. We can do it tomorrow. And the good news is, while it's helpful to have a coach or someone like me to help you, sometimes just the effort of putting pen to paper is enough to generate the kinds of behaviors, the thinking that I'll talk to you about. So um, I'm going to do a quick hop over to the chat. Layoffs, learning how to teach remotely, me too. Um, okay. So this gives me a sense of what people's are thinking about, what people are thinking about um, how to adapt. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, this question of like, how do I adapt myself to changing times and how do I adapt myself to changing needs? So I have different needs, organizations have different needs. How do I continue to be relevant, prepared? Um, and also aligned, right? And we'll talk a little bit about what that means to me. So let me, before I start moving into some of the tactics and strategies, um, let me talk to you a little bit about, because it's kind of the orienting principles I think about in terms of helping people find career stamina. Um, as Greg mentioned, we'd love to see your faces if we could. Um, we'll be handling questions. Greg's gonna help me navigate the Q&A so that you know, we're, if there are things that are time sensitive and pertinent to what I'm talking about, we wanna be able to engage with that. And um, we'll also have some Q&A at the end. So, uh, but don't, don't hesitate. If you feel like something's on your mind based on something I'm saying, let's, let's get into it. My, my goal for this is that it's practical. You, everybody walks out of here with something they can put into place right away. Um, so philosophical underpinnings of how I think, largely informed by my research, also informed by 20 something years of doing this work. Um, first thing I'm gonna say, and this is something I learned from people who'd been laid off and who had really suffered as a result of layoff. Um, so I don't want to have any mistake or bones about this. We are in a relationship with work. Work forms a massive component of our identity. The number I like to throw out there is that most of us are going to spend 90,000 hours of our lives at work. Um, that is a bigger number than any of us will spend doing any other kind of conscious activity in our lives. We will sleep about 123,000 hours in our life if we're lucky. Um, we'll work 90,000 hours. It's more time than we'll spend with our partners and spouses, more time than we're going to spend with our kids. Um, so my point of view on this is if that's the truth, if that's the case, then I want to make sure that is time that is purposeful, above all purposeful, where I feel like I have agency over my career. This is something I discovered through studying layoff, that we are, don't just do our work. We don't just go to work. We are in relationship with work, which is why it has the potential to hurt us. Right. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll be someone who says I have been laid off. I have been in situations where I thought I was ready for promotion and I was not given promotion. I have been in places where I watched people around me accelerate and I couldn't understand why I wasn't accelerating. Right. And it, I felt pain and biologically what's happening in our brains is the same kind of pain we feel when we hurt ourselves. Um, so we want to understand that we are in relationship because it helps understand why we, or explain why we sometimes go home or, you know, maybe we're not going anywhere right now, but, you know, shut down our laptop at 7.30 and we feel deflated and defeated. And that old message of like, it's just a job. That's nothing I do would support that statement. It's not just a job. Our work is our way of expressing ourselves and participating in the world. And I offer this because it helps explain why it hurts. If ever you've been in the position, if that's what brought you here, the sense of discomfort or pain, it's real and uh, we wanna acknowledge that, put it out there. Something else I say all the time comes out of my research is that understanding how you are at work will tell you a lot about how you are at, in life. And what I often say is how you do one thing is how you do everything. And what I learned are the people who have good habits around tuning into what they need and want from work and taking action in service of their goals are usually doing it in other domains of their lives. And the good news is we can be trained, we can learn good behaviors. And the other good news is that we can borrow things that are working in other domains of our lives and bring them into work. So if you've got really good habits around the gym, but less good habits around networking, I'm going to encourage you to look at what's working in various domains of your life and borrow heavily. How you do one thing is how you do everything. How you live is how you work. So I'll come back to this throughout the, the night. Something else I'll say is that the work that has to be done to build stability in our careers is a blend of what I call inner work and outer work. We'll spend some time on inner work tonight. That's the reflection, the planning, the aspiring, 
the clarifying that happens with yourself and a pen or yourself and a coach or yourself and a dear trusted friend, right? That is the clarifying internally, the, the using of the resources internally, that is the stamina building. There are things that we have to do that are I call outer work. And that inco- involves talking with other people, engaging strategically with your network, taking experiments in the world of work, whether it's where you are now independently or through some other kind of interview or approach for a new job. And I want us to think about inner and outer work because it's the cycle of reflection and action. We can't think ourselves entirely out of a bad work work situation. We can't act entirely. We have to do a blend of both. I I speak in the language of data collection. So what I'm thinking about is collecting new information, new insights, new relationships. Some of that happens internally. You're clarifying your values. You're going through your work history to pull up really significant moments and understand what they meant for you. You're also gathering data from other people. Either people are giving you feedback about you or they're teaching you things about their industry, their company, they're part of the organization. We are constantly assembling data and sifting through it to figure out what we wanna do with it. So I offer that reflection and action framework for you to think we cannot create career resilience by sitting alone in our homes behind our laptops. We also can't do it by throwing spaghetti at the wall and not really lining what we learn from the outside world up with what we need internally, okay? Um, I really think about career development as having three main components. There is a mindset piece of this. Um, There is, you know, stamina itself is a set of muscles that are really mindsets, that are really about belief, that are really about maintaining a positive attitude, even when things are difficult, about clearing what I call the mind trash, some of which we'll talk about tonight, the kind of stories that we carry that stop us from taking chances or from moving in particular directions. Um, It's about alignment. One of the gifts of, of I've learned through the people I've studied who've been laid off is this opportunity to really tune in to who they are now. The people who have different kinds of outcomes after layoff are doing the work to understand who they are now, what they need now and seeking work that is aligned from a values perspective, from a strengths perspective, from an experience perspective. And of course, it's a skill set. There are better ways to network. There are more strategic ways to present yourself online. We might get into a little bit of that last piece tonight, um, but I do distinguish between the things that we have to manage from a mindset point of view and the hard skills around negotiations or having a strong LinkedIn profile, okay? Um, I just love to show this slide because so much of what I learned from my um, participants was how much This is like the visual representation of how you do one thing is how you do everything. How you see yourself is how you end up seeing the world. And what I've learned that there is that there's behaviors we can use to clarify and to choose how we see ourselves so that we have more options as we think about building stamina going forward. I just always like to stick the slide in there. Um, Okay, so that's a little bit of my framework and how the orienting principles I use to think about work. When I think about helping someone figure out how to get unstuck, which is usually how people present to me, they come and say, I feel stuck, right? I'm either I've been laid off and I don't know what to do now, or I'm in a job for six, seven, eight, nine years. I'm in an industry for 15, 20 years. And I just, I I don't think it's working, but I don't know what to do instead. I always say there's three primary questions that we wanna explore. And the framework of which I'm gonna offer you tonight, this is the same framework that the worksheet's constructed around. Uh, And those three questions are, one, what do you want? And we'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Second question is, where are you coming from? How do you build the story of your work history as nonlinear, as complex, or as straightforward and maybe even boring as it might seem to you? How do you learn to construct a story that's compelling, not only to other people, but to you that you believe deeply that amplifies your strengths that amplifies the kinds of stories you wanna share with the world so the people who need to know about those stories can hear them. And the third question is what's next? How do we begin to generate alternatives, especially if we feel like we are in a place where we have been doing one thing for a very long time, or you know, I'm someone who spent almost 18 years in one institution, right? How do you start to think about options when everything you know comes from one place? You've worked with the same colleagues for a long time. Everyone you know is in that industry. How do you start creating options? I'm a massive believer in options and it's work to create them. 
but that's what we all want, right? That's what keeps us engaged, excited. That's what helps keep things vibrant for us in the development process. These are the three questions I'm asking myself. I'm asking my clients and we're working through in our work together, whether it's in a class or a group coaching thing I'm doing, or we're working one-on-one. What do you want? Where are you coming from? And what could be next? Okay. So let's start at the very beginning um, with want. So I use the language of careers desires. What do we really want? Right? Remember what I said, we spend 90,000 hours of our lives at work, the single greatest amount of conscious time that you're gonna spend doing anything. So especially if you find yourself at a breaking point, at a rupture, at a disruption, this is the moment to ask yourself what you want. We are not great at this, if I'm honest. My experience is that most of us don't really know what we want. We know what we think we could do. We know what we think we should do, but we don't really know what we want. And I want us to have an invitation for the hour that we're together tonight and for the duration of the time that you spend in my worksheet or you spend listening to my podcast or you spend thinking about yourself to really invite yourself to think about want. What is the thing? So should, you know, I love the expression, we have to stop shooting all over ourselves. I mean, if you haven't heard that, that's my invitation to start using it in all of your vocabulary. Um, Should is very powerful, right? Because many of us have commitments and obligations, right? We have mortgages to pay and kids to put through college and bills that pile up. And yet should is extremely oppressive and limiting way to look at the world. And I'm never going to deny reality. I'm never going to not deny the need to pay a mortgage or health insurance. But I don't want to begin a relaunch under the trap of should, right? Same thing with could. Um, when I hear could, I often feel like defeat. And I could call my old boss up and see if they've got something going on in their organization. I could go back to accounting, even though I feel like I finished my time in that field and I'm ready for something else. And I wanna challenge us to really think about should and could as limits. And I'm thinking about expansion. Um, I often feel that way about must, if I'm honest, because must, and I, I mentioned earlier that I work, I do a fair amount of teaching at the School of Public Health. And these are students who, I mean, they're quite young, but they feel very called to serve in a particular way in the world. And um, some of them would even say they're really clear on their purpose, which is a whole other bag of nails we can talk about in the Q and A if there's time. Must can be very, very powerful and must can also be very, very limiting because must can be the kind of thing that feels like there's one way to deliver on my calling, my purpose, the way that I meant to work in the world. And once again, I want us to really put those things aside and operate from a place of desire. What is the thing that lights you up? What is the thing that you can't stop thinking about? What are the problems that you see in the news on LinkedIn? Even when you're talking with friends at dinner, that you can't stop but get into. And it doesn't have to be a problem on a global scale. Sometimes it's noticing inefficiencies in how leadership teams perform. Sometimes it's not being able to take your mind off. I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, um, I had two clients who worked in supply chain who were pulling their hair out about what was happening with the pork industry, right? Because for them, that is a problem that they can't stop thinking about. How do I get something from A to B? How do I move products? How do I move services? So whatever it is that you can't stop talking about, thinking about, that's evidence of what you want. Here's something else that tells you, your life is the best data source you're ever going to find about what you want, right? When you think about how you spend your time outside of work, when you think about what kinds of films you watch, where you want to go for vacation, there's evidence, there's, there's, there are clues. I sometimes say it's like an excavation site. You're just brushing away the debris to figure out what are the bones of what I think about, what I read, what I can't stop talking about, the times at work where I felt the best. The times at work where I, you know, I, I hold on to artifacts, I hold on to photos of those colleagues, I hold on to that tag from that conference. Let's get really curious and intelligent about understanding what it is that we want, because that want is a source of energy. And when we talk about building resilience and we talk about building stamina, knowing what we want is what allows us to keep going when things are tough. Um, and there's lots of other reasons to know what you want, right? 
when you know what you want, you can design work that's in alignment with your values. If you have not done a values inventory since business school, which is usually the last time most of us have done one, I might advocate going online. There's one called Via Strengths, V-I-A Strengths. Uh, it's free. Um, and it's a beautiful tool that helps you check in with your values. Um, that will help you understand what you want to, right? And knowing that allows you to look for things that are in alignment with what you need now, not what you needed five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but what you need now. Um, we're going to talk about the should trap a little more in a moment. Um, knowing what you want also allows you to stay focused. So something else that I noticed in the people who I was studying who were laid off when they really clarified the ones who thrived were the ones who got really focused on what they were after. They weren't applying for 8 billion jobs. They were very targeted in terms of the kinds of roles they wanted to have, the kinds of companies they wanted to work for, uh, the kinds of skills they wanted to put forth. And in, the world's extremely distracting. It's surprisingly distracting considering that most of us don't leave our homes very much. But if you look at LinkedIn or if you're looking on the job boards elsewhere at the companies you like, there's so much pinging. There's so many options. There's so many webinars. It's really easy to lose track of what's important for you. We all get the same 168 hours a week. And one of the ways to make sure you don't lose time is to know what you want. So you're not hunting for things you don't want. Nyla, um, the, the, we got a question. What's that page again? Was it VIA, Via Strengths? Via Strengths. I want to say that's what it's called. Um, I don't want to Google in the middle of this, but I'm pretty sure it's called yeah. the Can you find it? I'll, I'll check it out and I'll put it in the uh, chat I when I find it. I have it right here because that's the kind of, yeah. Via the, it's called the VIA Institute on Character is the name of the organization. And they have a free tool. Mm -hmm. um, so that if, Greg, if you Google that, the um, VIA. VIA Character Strengths uh, Survey and Character Report. That's it. Yeah, they call it Character Perfect. Strengths, which is really values. So Excellent. I'll put that in the chat. Support. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I'm a big believer in, and listen, I always think about assessments and you guys have all probably been through a number in your lives, whether it's StrengthsFinder or Hogan's or anything else, they're data. It's not gospel, it's information and it's our job to filter through it. But the thing at the point I'm trying to make is that most of us haven't done this in years. We're carrying a blueprint that's probably from our, you know, early career, maybe 20, 25 years old. And it's, it's worth doing to update that periodically in your career. Um, the final thing I'll say about knowing what you want is that it lets people help you. To me, the big, I dread, I spent 16 years student facing at Columbia. So thousands and thousands and thousands of students. The worst thing they can say to me is, uh, can I pick your brain without clarity? Or when I say to them, well, how can I help you? They don't know the answer to that, right? Knowing what you want allows you to ask people for pointed, useful help, and they know what to do to make your life easier. So another reason I'm, I'm evangelical about knowing what you want. The truth is most of us haven't asked ourselves this question in years uh, because we were, we're doing what we have been doing. Like what I'm doing is what I've been doing for the last five or seven years. And perhaps this is your experience too. When something disruptive happens, there's new leadership, there's layoff. You suddenly say to yourself, oh my God, am I going to fight for that? Do I really? Yeah, I was doing it. Yeah, I was doing it fine the last couple of years. But if I ask myself if I was happy, if I felt there was meaning in the work I was doing, if I went home at night peaceful, put my head down on my pillow with peace, many of us, and I've had this experience myself, are not doing what we want to do. We know we're doing what we've become good at. And there's a difference between, if you've ever heard the expressions, your zone of excellence versus your zones of genius, this is, the, this is the distinction, right? Zones of excellence are things we've all become good at. I've become good at a lot of things I never need to do again in my life, right? But I just, I've been doing it for 10, 12 years. So now people call me for it or my staff would ask me for it or the dean would ask me for it. And in my heart, I'd be like, oh, but I was good at it. The difference is a zone of genius. I don't feel that, oh, I, f I go into it. I feel flow, if you're familiar with that concept. And at the end of a couple of hours, I don't feel depleted like I need a nap. I feel like I could keep going. That felt like it leveraged my strengths and it was thrilling. Uh, that's why I'm so evangelical about knowing what you want. Okay. And yet there's so many reasons we don't go after it. And I, you know, here's one of the things that coaching, a gift of coaching, if you've ever had the chance to work with a coach or be in a coaching group, um, one of the things that always blocks us is the stories we carry about why we shouldn't have what we want, right? It's too expensive. I'm too far gone in my career. 
the kids would pay the price for if I chose to go after that kind of work. I can't make enough money. They would never value the MBA. All those things that we hear as black and white truths are often stories that we carry. Now, again, I'm never going to tell you, you don't need to pay your mortgage. I am going to ask you to challenge the stories that stop you from going for, for what you want. And this is not on every single person I know, myself included, carries stories about why I shouldn't go for what I want. And mostly it has to do with, it wouldn't make sense. You know, I should, if I was going to do that, I should have done it seven years ago. I have to wait till the kids go to college. You know, you hear yourself say that. And if you were with a dear friend or someone you really valued from work, you would say, come on, let's think it through before you eliminate that option. Let's think it through. I'm going to invite you to do the same thing for yourself. And if you say you want something, even if you just say it to yourself, I would invite you to not shut yourself down right away, to give yourself the space. Now, this is something that the people I studied who experienced thriving after layoff were doing. And even if in the end, they didn't become a full-time jewelry maker, as one of my former MBAs was experimenting with after her layoff, it still taught her a lot about what she really wanted from work. And if she had not given herself the time to let herself explore her desire, we, ne we ne may never have learned some of the things that helped her make her ultimate pivot. This idea of how we block ourselves from going after what we want or even exploring what we want is, um, if there's one thing you take away tonight, I hope it's this. Um, yeah, it, it means a ton. And I think it's the, it's, the, it's the thing that unlocks options if we can start being in pursuit of what we want. On your worksheet, the first third of the first page, maybe the first half of the first page are some questions to help you think through what you want. Um, I sometimes use the expression, what is work worth doing? When you think about 90,000 hours of your life, what makes it worth it? Um, and sometimes we do it by trusting our feelings, what I love. Sometimes you go into factors and, and, and components. What are the kinds of people I like to be around? What's the kind of task I love to do where I don't notice time passing? That's that flow concept. Um, and one of the last question in the section is one of my favorites, which is what are the kinds of experiences I'm having when I have the thought, I oh, God, I wish I had more of this in my day, right? I wish that wasn't over, right? I wish there was, my day was full of those kinds of moments or conversations or thinking, fill in the blank. So we won't do it together now, but um, at some point I invite you to spend some time thinking about this. I'm a believer in a pen and paper. And there's a, t I will tell you this, and we'll get to like my big findings at the end of this presentation. 100% of the people who met my criteria for thriving after layoff in my original study were engaging in reflective practice. The most common reflective practice is journaling. And it's like the biggest cliche in the world to say like, stop and express your gratitude and plan your day out. The evidence is abundant. Um, it shows up in my studies over and over again. Now, it doesn't always look like journaling. Some people meditate, some people pray, some people run in the woods, but most people journal. It's secular, it's cheap, it's portable. Um, yeah, and I'll tell you something, another tool I love for reflection, for clarifying this what I want question, if you don't love the pen and paper, is your phone. It probably has a voice memo feature. And I make a lot of my clients just talk into their phones uncensored, just talk and no one has to hear it but you, but it's the idea of, get, of unloading your mind, your desires. Okay, so first question is always, what do I want? And how do I stop myself from stopping myself? How do I notice the mental blocks I carry? I call that the mind trash um, that stops us from going after what we want. And again, I'm not, most of us are not gonna become circus performers or Hollywood actors, but we can learn from our desires. So if you do love to make things, what does that tell you about what you want from work? I want more creativity. I want more autonomy. I want more freedom. If you love to socialize and you're like, I can't make a living or I'm not willing to make a living as a party planner, what else does that tell you about collaboration, about brainstorming, about community that you can bring? So get curious. I always say to my clients, like, let's put on a lab coat. What is, there's, there's data in there. It's not always the first thing that shows up. The fact that I like Netflix doesn't mean that I should become a television producer, but it does mean that I love stories. I love, I mean, if I think back to my childhood, as we all do as a source of data, I spent all my time reading novels, reading fiction my whole life. What does that mean? I'm not a novelist. What I am interested in is human development, how people change their lives, right? It took me years to figure out that's what the evidence was in the books. It really wasn't about writing novels. 
It was about how people change and grow up and mature. Okay, um, Greg, you'll stop me if there's something that I need to jump into in the chat. Okay. We'll do. We'll do. All right. So let's feel free to direct all questions to the chat, everyone, as they come up. Mm. I'd love to hear from you guys too. Um, and I'll make a pause after the next section. Then we'll uh, take some more questions at the end. Okay. First question is, what do you want? Second question is, where are you coming from? Also known as how awesome are you? Right. And this is something that can be hard for us, especially if we've been hurt by work, right? We can start feeling, well, something must be wrong with me. Or if I was disposable, even if they closed a function, they eliminated a whole team, they shut down the San Diego office. It's really, it's really easy to internalize um, those disruptions as having meaning about us. And it helps us see often how much we have been hooked on using our title and our organization to describe what it is that we do. And if either that has gone away through layoff or through you, you leaving a job, or you don't want it to be the way that people know you. And I'll use myself as an example. Again, when I left Columbia, I'd been the Dean of Students there for 17 years. Everybody knew me. I mean, everybody in that world knew me. It's not like I was internationally known, but in that community, people knew who I was. And my fear was that if I told people I was looking for something, they would always see me as the Dean of Students. And then how would I ever get something else to do? Because there's only so many Deans of Students in New York City, right? Um, we have to learn to think about our work history, to think about our skills, and be able to talk about them with confidence and honesty in a way that's compelling to other people. That is um, another set of behaviors I had. To, I watched the people who were misplaced or displaced learn how to do, and they were doing it without the benefit of saying, I'm a director of marketing in this company, because maybe that was no longer the case. I think about the way that you talk, answer this question, where am I coming from, as a series of components, right? So obviously, you have your training and your education. You have a BA or a BS or MBA, you have, or an MS, you have some kind of formal education. Over the years, you've probably picked up certificates, series seven, all those types of things that you've picked up professionally over your life. Uh, you also have picked up skills, some of them formally, some of them informally. We, most of us learn how to manage people by managing people. Most of us learn how to manage projects by managing projects. Sometimes there's a certification, but sometimes we just know how to do things because we've done them. Um, we also are, are, data set of where we're coming from also includes all these key experiences, wins and setbacks, right? So things that you've learned because you've launched a product and maybe it went on schedule, maybe it did not go on schedule. Maybe you built a team, maybe you had to lay people off on your own team. Uh, those are all pieces of evidence that we use to build a career narrative. Uh, the final thing that I think about that a lot of people underestimate is not, is not leaning so heavily on simply the discussion points, but adding themselves into the question of how awesome are you or where are you coming from, which is what is the unique imprint you bring to the work? Because as you guys know, you, you can often be in an organization on a team where there are six of you, four of whom have MBAs, four of whom spend time in investment banking before moving into something else. How do you distinguish yourself from the others? And it's by that unique imprint, the thing that you do that's just a little bit different than how pe other people do it right? What makes Michael do things Michael's way, right? What makes Jackie do things Jackie's way? Now, this can often be hard for us to see. So when I talk about inner and outer work, one of my favorite tools to help people understand their unique imprint is to ask the people who know them, who work for them, who work around them, who have been their colleagues in their, this current most recent job or in the past. What I'll sometimes say is all of us have had that experience where someone says, can I run something past you? Or do you mind putting your eyes on this draft? Or would you give me your feedback? They're looking for something from you. They want to know something that you can contribute. And often because it's easy for us, we don't think of it as a skill. We don't think of it as a strength. We think of it like, well, everybody, right? Like in the example I'll give for myself is I'm really good with language. So if you write an email that's full of complex messages or delivering tough news or preparing for a conversation with a teammate that might include tough news. Always professionally, people would come to me and say, can I run that conversation past you? Can I, do you mind reading this or can I role play it with you so I can practice saying something? Now, it took me a while to understand not everybody has the fluency 
that I have. That, by the way, is probably a result of reading all those books uh, as a kid in the library. But there is something that you do that you do naturally that you may not even give yourself credit for. And the good news is you don't have to know that all by yourself. That's a really smart way to enlist your network. In fact, one of the five key behaviors that people who thrived after layoff did was engage with their network to learn, not just to connect and to transact, but to learn. And often the subject they were learning about was themselves. Um, So that's one of my favorite activities. Um, I will say, and I'm looking a little bit at the audience composition here. This is one of the only places in my research where gender shows up that um, when I asked people who were laid off, what was the first thing you thought you would do? Most, if not all of the men in my original study, which was around hundred people said, I thought I would consult. The first thing I thought I would do was take my skill set and package it and then sell it back to either the person who just laid me off or to other people in my network. The women, 100% of the women in my first survey said, I thought I would go get a second master's or a coaching certification or a consulting skills course. And then I would think about sharing my skills. And I say that only because it's, it's I'm not a gender researcher. I don't specialize in women's leadership. Um, but this was a place that struck me that women have a harder time saying, this is what I'm excellent at. This is the reason you want me on your team. This is how 15 years in industry has prepared me to solve the problem that you guys face as a business or the opportunity that you face as a business. So one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this piece of the work is that we owe it to ourselves, not just women, all of us, to be able to claim our value, to claim our worth by really understanding not what your job responsibilities were, but what you did, how you shaped the outcomes, how you contributed to the team, how you drove results how you left an impact on the business. This is, again, this is excavation. There's a tool on my website you can download. And it's one of the final slides. I'll put it there so you guys can pull it down. I call it a highlight reel. It is a way of building a narrative of key events, key successes in your work history and to make sure that you feature as a lead actor in that story. Because it's very common and listen, quite lovely that we say, well, our team did this we delivered. What I want to know for the purposes of preparing you to have strategic networking conversations and to have successful interviews is where you are in the picture. What was the contribution you made? I'm not asking you to take credit for a team's performance. I am asking you to shine a spotlight on your contribution so we know what makes you different. We know how you took all that training, all that education, all the things you've learned over time, all those key experiences, and added your unique thumbprint and you contributed. So the, the worksheet's available. What I usually say to people is try to fill out three or four of them and get comfortable talking about what, where you're coming from. What makes, you, what makes it reasonable, if not absolutely necessary, that we advance a conversation, that I definitely put your resume in front of somebody, that I definitely advance you to the next step in a process, that I definitely introduce you to people who can help you because I really know what you know how to do, okay? I'm gonna say the same thing I said last time. There are lots of reasons we block ourselves from taking credit. There are lots of reasons we tell ourselves, I was just the right place, right time. Um, I can't possibly take credit for that. I was really a junior player on that team or um, I can't really be proud of my career narrative because I took time off to be with the kids or I took time off to help my father when he was sick or to build my family business. And I just want us to always be bringing our consciousness to this is the mindset stuff how we block ourselves, how we hold ourselves back, how we limit ourselves, how we, you know, we express one thing and we like shut ourselves up almost immediately. Um, Especially if there's been disruption in your career, you have to be able to talk about what it is that you do and what it is that you want to do, right? This is the connection of the narrative. This is what I want. I'm craving. I need, I want to be able to help. And here's what prepares me. This is my, where am I coming from? This is what prepares me to be the right person for us to have this conversation, for me to put my hat in the ring, for you and I to meet, for you to introduce me to that person who can help me. All right, this is how we build the elements of a narrative, okay? Again, on your worksheet, um, I offer a couple of questions to get you thinking about your value, your expertise, um, and there's some sentence stems here to help you think through, like, how do you say things? Like, circumstances where I really shine are, 
I'm at my best when. Uh, when I consider the moments I've had the most impact at work, I'm about halfway through page two, a common theme is my ability to, or my record of, and the highlight rule will help you do this. If this feels really hard for you, if you're like, oh God, how would I ever talk about myself like this? Uh, try the highlight reel, but spend time with these questions. The people who recover well from layoff and from disruption know how to, I call it claiming their value. They know how to distinguish themselves. They know how to tell the story of a career, agnostic of a title, agnostic of an organization, often because they have to. Or they've been in the market for a while. They can't say, well, in my current role. So they have to build a narrative that stands on its own. They have to claim their value. Okay. That's the second key question I want us to have time to, um, to think through. And this, again, there's lots of um, reasons we stop ourselves, but I'm going to encourage you to enlist the help of a friend or a trusted ally to get through some of that. Okay. Um, again, I'm happy to take questions on this. Um, let's go to the third set of questions, which is um, what could be next? Oh, let me go back one more. Okay. Um, I'm a believer in options. Um, I think there is, there's always, there are times in our lives where what makes sense is if something has ended or something must end, we go for the first next best thing, right? We just, a friend calls and says, I know things are shutting down where you are or things are coming to a close. There's something in my organization that's nearly identical you want it. And there's times where we have to do that. We've all done that. Um, if we have the luxury of pausing and reflecting and creating options, this is my approach for thinking about it. Um, I usually think about personal research questions, right? The thing that I want to be in pursuit of are things I am curious about, but don't yet know. I want to ask good personal research questions. I'll show you what I mean by that. I want to take intentional action, right? Step by step, purposeful, not just applying every time a company I have my eye on posts something I easy apply on LinkedIn. I want to be purposeful in my action. I want to analyze new data, right? So that's why that inner and outer work. Every time I have a conversation with somebody on the outside, every time I have a screening interview with a recruiter, I want to run it through my internal system. What are my values? What do I want? And then you got to manage the self-talk, right? Like I often say, um, we got to talk to ourselves more than we listen to ourselves because the, the, the voice inside is usually not very nice to us, right? So talk to yourself more than you listen to yourself. What do I mean by personal research questions? Some of us are gifted with the always knowing what's next, right? Most of us are not. So what I like to think about is what don't you know that you would need to know to take one step on the game board, right? Often those things show up like worries or curiosities that we can't stop thinking about, right? So a worry might look something like, I'm worried I have too much experience for that role. They would never consider me because I'm too senior, or I'm worried that I don't have enough experience for that role. I've never managed people or I haven't managed large teams in this role um, requires managing large teams. So the research question I would build around that is what kinds of skills, what kinds of experiences does this hiring manager really wanna know about in order to move me through the next conversation? How might my experience, another research question might be, how does my experience, I'll use myself, um, in higher education as a large senior unit leader, senior leader, translate into what an HR team might need in medical diagnostics. That was the career jump I made, right? I left higher ed to go into corporate HR. What, how might my skills be transferable coming from where I'm coming from, given what this HR team needs? I love a question that is a how or a what question because it has options. It's not a yes or no question. Um, and I love a question that relieves worry. Right? If someone says to me, I'm worried that they can't match my salary, I like to say, okay, how can we find out? If someone says, I'm worried that I don't have the right, I have, this is a phone call yesterday with a guy who's at a large financial institution looking to go into a startup as a CFO. Um, I'm worried that they want me to be closer to product than I have been in the last 10 years. How can I find out? right? Um, how do we collect data? Once we have good research questions, how do we collect data? There's three primary ways that I collect information. The first thing is exploring appropriate jobs. 
You'll notice I don't say applying for appropriate jobs. Um, one of the reasons I don't say that is because for most of us, applying for jobs looks like cl clicking easy apply on LinkedIn, uh, which is a black hole. I'm occasionally people land injuries and conversations through that. But um, before the pandemic, we would have said something like 84% of jobs that required experience were coming through networks. That's how people were landing jobs, through networking. So that number has only increased since the pandemic because now everyone's home, everyone's in front of a laptop, everyone has the resume loaded into LinkedIn and everyone's clicking easy apply. So recruiters are drowning in applications and it's really hard to penetrate that environment. What I'm talking about is exploring appropriate jobs looking for information from the postings, right? So I like to say to my clients, let's look, whether you're using dream organizations or dream titles, let's look at five to seven job descriptions and let's pull them down. I still print, I apologize. And let's code them. Let's look for them like in the responsibilities and the qualifications with a green, uh, a yellow or an orange and a red highlighter, code them. Red, I would never wanna do this part of the job. Or I certainly don't have that kind of experience. No, it's a blocker, right? Uh, yellow, I could do that again. I might be interested in that. Or I think it would be an easy lift. I could learn that with a couple of hours with a LinkedIn course. Or if I pulled up my accounting notebooks and refreshed myself, I'm interested enough to try. Green is like, yeah, I'd love to do that. Can't wait. I want us to start. So when people have in their minds... A startup would never hire for a CFO, someone who spent six years in private wealth. I want to know that. How do we find out? We find out by looking at real evidence as opposed to listening to the story in our minds. We look at real job descriptions, figure out what are the skills they're actually asking for? What are the requirements they believe they need for this role? And how much does that align with what I know from my last question, which is where am I coming from? Let's find out. Let's look at real data. It's one place we collect data. Second place we collect data is by networking, asking purposeful, pointed, strategic questions to people who can help us. This is why you need to know what you want and you need to know where you're coming from so that when you reach out to people, they know how they can help you. I'm trying to figure out more about the direction this organization is going in vis-a-vis -vis talent development. I'm trying to figure out how many engineers you already have on your team and what is the set of skills you're missing on your team so I can figure out if I'm the right candidate. Right, so this is having really intentional, people ask, whenever I have someone who's like, I'm not sure if I can make a pivot from industry to industry or from role to role, I always say, we don't have to know by ourselves. Let's identify five to seven people who've made that kind of pivot, who've left an organization after 15 or 20 years and gone somewhere else, who've pivoted from nonprofit to for-profit, who've gone from being CEOs of small agencies to being in-house as the head of a practice, what did they give up? What did they gain? We don't have to know by ourselves. We find out, we ask good research questions, we design purposeful research questions, and we network with the right people to find out. The third way I like to collect data is through experimentation, what I call making work, right? And sometimes, so I have a client right now who has been a um, CFO for small tech companies for years and wanted to figure out if she could, she wants to go back to living near her family on the West Coast, wants to start her own practice, but she wants to do kind of a, CFO for hire, right? Like, can I, for, can I find a series of small startups who need someone for six, eight, nine months until to build their systems and then to help recruit the right person? She's not ready to leave her full-time gig yet, but she needs to make this move to the West Coast and wants to figure out if this is possible. So she's making work. She's running an experiment. She's identifying, because she's a West Coaster originally in her network, what are, can she identify one or two small companies who need the help? Can she pitch the business? Can she find out if it's a viable business. It's a viable practice. Does she have all the skills she needs to get that going? Does she have strong enough relationships? She's making work. She's creating a small project where she creates the parameters. She defines what success would look like. She figures out what she has to offer, what she doesn't yet know. And that's how she's gathering data. Is it viable for me to open a practice in Seattle? She's going to find out by trying a small piece of work rather than quitting her job and moving to the West Coast. Okay, there's lots of ways in which we can make work. We can make work internally. If we are in an organization and we think we might be curious, I'm working with someone in large pharma right now who's been a clinical scientist for years and wants to move towards patient advocacy. The way she made work 
was by saying to her manager and to the patient advocacy group, can I give you 20% of my time over the next six months to help you complete a project? You get to use my clinical skills. I get to figure out if this move I'm curious about is really right for me, right? So I love the idea of making work because we get to define what success looks like. This is one of the key behaviors people in my studies did as a way of thriving. They create safe, measurable, small experiments to collect new information. Okay. Um, where else can you get evidence or information? Um, I love from design thinking, you love to borrow the ideas of lateral inspiration. So sometimes lateral inspiration comes to people we know. Sometimes it's just stories you read about. Um, lately, it's been so interesting, whether it's the New York Times or the Atlantic or LinkedIn, there's all these profiles of people who are making pretty big changes as a result of the pandemic, sometimes out of necessity, sometimes out of desire. I just love to look at personal stories and see what's, what people are moved by and how they make changes. Um, online, so there's an embarrassment of resources around how we can figure out what companies are growing in particular directions, where they're making investments, where they're making pivots. Um, same thing, I mean, especially in the last year, so many webinars and um, conferences are now free or very low cost. Um, any human who can help you. I mean, this is one of the reasons I'm such a believer in designing research questions around people's career journeys. Like how did people make a decision that it was time to go back to school? How did people make a decision it was time to go from a large multinational organization into a small startup? How did people make a pivot out of startups back into larger companies? Um, truth is most of us love to be the hero of our own movies. We love to talk about ourselves. So if you have good questions, I think you'll find people really love to talk about what they've learned, what they have to offer, what they think you should do, which you can take with a grain of salt. But um, I think the more purposeful your question is, the more likely it is people will say, yes, I would love to talk to you about that. Okay. Um, the thing about last note about data is when I think about collecting data, I think we have to all manage to stay somewhat neutral around data for a, a period of time, right? And to not every time we hear a story be like, oh, I should do that. Oh, I should not do that because they didn't do it, right? But to collect information to be, you know, as neutral and objective as possible, sometimes for two weeks, sometimes for 30 or 60 days because we're in data gathering mode. And just to kind of assemble the stories, the tips, the ideas that we get and look for patterns, look for, um, what it might mean to us and how to integrate it, go back to the inner work. How do we integrate it into what we really need and want um, and not just take every story as, as, a, as gospel, okay? Um, I wanna make sure that I review, these are the five primary behaviors that I talk about all the time that came out of my original study. What do people who thrive after layoff do? And when I say thrive, I mean, the, largely it is measured by their, how they report their experience of the relationship they have with work. It feels free. It feels creative. It feels like they have agency and it feels like they have options. First thing, they engage in a consistent reflective practice. So we've talked about journaling. Um, I'd be curious to know if you guys have reflective practices that really work for you. Um, sometimes that is, like I said before, some people um, run or they do meditation, they do yoga, they do some kind of other activity. Sometimes coaching groups, career groups provides that, that space where I can think things through and talk things through. Um, again, it's one of those things we all know is good for us. It's like lifting weights. We all know we should do it. I'm going to tell you that if you want different outcomes from work, you must do it. It's really that 100% of people who meet my criteria are doing this. Um, they use their networks to learn about themselves and what could be next. And I think this is one of the, this is one of the surprises for me because I knew most jobs came from networks, but I always assumed networking was really about exchanging information about stuff, not about us. Um, but what I found was that, especially around that question of where am I coming from? How do I build a narrative that feels honest and also meaningful, substantial, that what people were doing was asking other people, how do you experience me? What are the things you call me for? What are the times where you think, you know what, we really need Nyla at the table for this. Just the right person to ask. What are the, because we're blind to what comes naturally. Okay, we think that everybody can have that and simply not true. Um, number three surprised me too, investing in yourself outside of work. It's the one thing we didn't really talk about in those three key questions. Something I found over and over again is that people who experienced great results were not obsessing about work. Um, they weren't, you know, I remember 
one of the women who I, I do qualitative research. So I spend like a long time interviewing people and then coding all their hours of, of uh, transcript. And this one woman said to me, she'd been laid off twice. I talked to her after the second time. And she said, the first time I was laid off, I had a job and my job was to look for a job. So I was like locked in my room for about 40 hours a week looking for a job. And I was fried. I was burned out. I was miserable. And it showed every time I had an interview. Like I was desperate. I was clingy. I was angry. Second time around, she made a big point of taking care of herself. Of She was um, a very spiritual person, like doing a lot of spiritual reading. She worked out a lot. She traveled with her sister, spent time with older relatives, capturing the stories of their childhoods. And she said, you know, that it made a massive difference by the time she got to sitting with um, interviewers because she had something to talk about beyond her desperation for work. And so what I often say is that investing in yourself outside of work allows you to experience yourself at your best as a like creative, resourceful, whole, joyful person again. And when we've been hurt by work, sometimes we just don't feel like that. We feel kind of broken and kind of like a shell of a person. This allows you to remember what it's like to feel good. When I say to you, what do you want? A lot of people are like, I don't really even know anymore. I'm like, what do you love to do? And again, it might have nothing to do with work, but I want you to be tuned in to you at your best. You know, I sometimes say at your juiciest, where you're the most creative, you're the most fun, you're the most innovative, you're the most compassionate. Investing in yourself reminds you of who you are in those moments. Um, the other thing it does is it right sizes the role of work in your life. Like work is, I often say work is like water. It creeps into every crevice, every minute. When it's good, you all know it. When work is awesome, you like wake up and you're like, oh, can't wait. Like I'm at it. When work is terrible, you get lay in bed thinking about work. The first thought you have when you wake up is work. Doing something else, it could be tennis, it could be French lessons, reminds you that you are human, not just a worker, um, which we need. I mean, if this year has taught us anything, let us let it teach us that. Uh, learning how to claim and communicate your value. We spent some time on that. Being able to really talk about who you are, not your title. Please, not your title, what you do, what your contribution is, how you think, how you solve problems, how you create opportunities. And finally, people who thrive, design and run experiments. They're willing to take chances. They're willing to build um, work around key questions, key curiosity, key worries, and uh, take the data and make sense of the data, even if they don't end up becoming jewelry makers, which was again, one of the stories that um, I alluded to before. Uh, those are the five main principles of career renewal. That's the language I use to talk about it. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. This is where you can download the worksheet on building a highlight reel. I highly recommend you do this. Make three or four for yourself because you need to learn to talk about what you're awesome at. So because people need to know it. Um, and then I think that's it, Greg. So maybe now we'll take questions or comments. Yes, please. Uh, thank, first of all, what a great presentation, Nyla. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much for that. Um, wonderful way to think about things. Um, so I really enjoyed it. I'm seeing some applaud emojis in the audience. Oh, Feel okay. free to please put some questions in the chat. I know that people have, you know, specific things about their situation and you know, ideas they've thought about. Um, so feel free to put your questions in the chat. This is a great opportunity um, to ask a you know, specific, specific questions, Nyla, um, that can help you in, in your career journeys. Yeah, I and really I, you know, I'm this. also curious to know, like, you know, if there's things that you, you when I, the, all the activities that I've suggested, if you're like, I've tried that, this has been my result, or I've never tried it, and here's why it feels really hard. Like, we have a little time, and I think we're doing a workshop based on this in the future, right? Yes, so we're going to be doing a slightly smaller workshop in terms of participants, um, in uh, early May. I'm going to send, I'm going to share the link to that uh, in the chat. Uh, we invite everyone to, to participate in that. It's going to be a smaller session, um, a group session that'll allow for a little bit more interaction. It's going to last 90 minutes. So I'll put that chat um, in the chat in a little bit before the end of the event. We have one question here from Madeline. How did you make the shift from Dean of Students to consultant? Mm, um, <laughs> let me say that I think, you know, it was interesting. Um, my research, my original research for my dissertation coincided with my decision that it was time to change jobs after 18 years or so. And it was very, very hard for me. And I, I basically stole every behavior I learned from my research and was like, I have to do all these things. Um, I was very, you know, this claim your value thing in particular was very hard for me because, you know, if someone asked me what I did for work, 
I would say I was the dean of students, which is not a job. It's not a verb. Like deaning is not a, a verb, right? But it, like, I didn't even know what I did. I just knew that I was busy all day. I had a ton of responsibilities. And that was one of the ways in which I learned to use my network. And I see this comment in here. How can you, can you share some tips for successful networking for introverts? I'm not an introvert, but um, one of the things I did was engage. Like I think about your network, like rings of a tree. So like the innermost ancient rings of that tree are the people who are closest to you and who already love you and have your back and who know you and who are willing to tell the truth. Um, so I would say, Marion, when you think about resilience, when you think about stamina, when you think about confidence, when you think about networking, I think of them as all those exercises. It's like muscles that we have to build. You become better the more you do it. The way to become stronger at networking is to start with the people who love you already and who want to help you and who know you. Um, so that was when I, when someone asked, how did I make the shift? I had to start by renaming and relabeling everything I knew how to do and that I love to do totally agnostic from my title. Um, that, that I have to be honest, took me several months because I had to, you know, there, I had, when I made lists of what I knew, I knew I could do, they were pages and pages. When I made lists of what I wanted to do it was much less. That work requires time and real reflection and real attunement to what your experience is week to week at work, right? Because again, our mind will play a million tricks on us. One of which is that if I'm good at something, I must love doing it which is not the same thing, right? If you've ever heard of the Igikai model of work, it's a Japanese um, framework for thinking about like, what is my purpose in life? Oh, you get that question. But it's a four quadrant model. And in the upper, if you can see me, the upper left-hand quadrant is the intersection of what I love to do and what I'm good at. That's where we have to spend some time. Because again, often we've become good at things we don't love anymore, but our brain thinks, well, if I'm efficient at it, I must really want to keep doing it. Um, I had to really now narrow, narrow that down. I also um, networked my face off. There's no other way to say it. Um, and I was fortunate because I was in a position where I had had such a rich number of people under, you know, who had worked, been my students that I knew. And, but I did develop this idea of research questions then to say, okay, I want to be very specific. And that's the thing I was looking for. I didn't go straight from that role to consultant. I made a four-year uh, stop in, in HR. And that was one of the questions, you know, I was like looking for an HR team who wanted somebody different because a lot of HR people grow up in HR and I did not grow up in HR. So I said, you know, who are the, who are the innovative thinkers in HR? Who are the, I've turns out what I learned was that private equity environments were often very open to non-traditional HR people or non-traditional infrastructure people, period. And I learned that through networking. And then I was able to target organizations um, that were private equity held and that helped me. Um, and I'm, you know, that I go on about that. Um, but I want great question. We're getting some yeah. uh, more great questions now. One, one person asked, after being laid off, I felt not valued. How can I get over this? Hmm. First of all, let me just say, I'm sorry. Um, because that's my podcast, by the way, in case somebody wants to, the inside, I probably didn't hyperlink it, but, um, I'm sorry because a layoff is painful. And I remember when I was doing my research, that I would have people describe layoff um, like a divorce or like a death. Like it felt that kind of grieving. Um, work really matters to us. It matters to our identity. It matters to our sense of purpose and belonging. Um, so first of all, I just, I would love to say just if you could give yourself the time to feel it and to not feel bad about feeling bad. Um, it is, um, it's a loss. And every transition requires the period of time in which we let go of what we loved about that job. And that might be personal. It might be relationships that we cared about. It might be our sense of belonging and value, adding, adding something to someone else's day. Um, there's all the practical reasons layoff sucks. Um, I think we start, I think, and I'm seeing other questions about resilience and focus. I think of it as um, it's all musculature. And we are making, although I've mentioned all these things are behavioral, it is behaviors that we are choosing, even though our brains are going to tell us, no, our brains are going to tell us, you know, I'm tired, I'm burned out, I feel like crap, I'm angry. So you're entitled to do nothing but be pissed. And we have to talk to ourselves more than we listen to ourselves. There's a saying that I love, which is that our brains will hold on to negative experiences like Velcro and 
release positive ones like Teflon, right? Your brain has a very strong negativity bias. And unfortunately, layoff will become one of those things that are replayed in our minds and it's held onto over and over again for long periods of time because it hurts. Um, what we have to begin doing is small activities, small exercises to build the muscle of belonging, of purpose, of adding value. So what I often say to people is, first of all, network and let people love you and respect you and take care of you um, and see you, right? And remind you of how powerful you are. Journal about that. Every time you have a successful networking conversation, even if you have a crappy networking conversation, reflect on it because you're learning something every time. Um, oh, my friend Janet's about to come in because of the waiting room. Um, so it's that, that activity of celebrating your wins and documenting them and capturing them. Um, I'm also a believer in that activity, right? Doing something that you love to do, that investing in yourself outside of work is a pathway to healing the scar tissue that comes from bad work. Whether it means you've been laid off, you've been, I see another question in here, you've just been hurt by work. Um, I'm gonna stop the screen so I can see you guys' faces. Um, doing something we love where we are at our best, we are helpful to the world, we are in, in the company of people we love, we are able to add value. So volunteering, um, even just teaching one person who comes from your industry something that you did that was valuable for your organization can help build that musculature of, I'm valuable, I'm helpful, I'm useful in the world, I'm seen and recognized and appreciated. So those are some of the ways in which we build, rebuild our stamina after the heartbreak of bad work. Um, but the first thing I'll say is like a little grace for you because it's, and again, anyone who ever says to you like, it's not personal, it's just work. Like, I don't know those people. Like that's, this is, this is our lives. This is where most of us spend most of our time. So I don't buy that for one second. A good question here, Nyla. How do you balance doing what you love to do, but the pay is low? Mm. Well, I'm going to offer, you know, I talk about those, all those sentences I had out there about the beliefs that sometimes stop us. Um, I would want to find out, first of all, if it's always true that the thing that you love has low pay and must always have low pay. So that I would probably start by designing a couple of research questions around whether or not that's true. Um, I would also go back to values and figure out if um, the work that you're doing, that's that service that you're providing um, is in your set of top values is money or security. Money is not usually about money. Usually it represents either security and safety or it represents freedom, you know, the ability to travel or do things that we love to do. I'd get, I'd get really curious about what money represents and figure out how we might bring those two closer together. Um, for a practical point of view, sometimes it's true that we um, do something to pay the bills and on the side um, or in a piece of our work that's not our primary work, we do the thing that we love. But I'd start by saying, is it true that in order to be doing something I love, I can't make money? And can I find out somebody who is doing something they love that feels deeply aligned with who they are and their values, who's making money? Um, let's like that to me is a an opportunity to challenge. Don't believe every thought you have. That's what I'll say. Mm, interesting. Another good question here. Um, someone says, this is a broad question. Can you share some tips for overcoming work-related trauma with trauma, say, having had difficult bosses or having worked at unstable organizations? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? I will say this, like as someone who is, um, who's been in really difficult situations and who's experienced a, an honest set of workplace traumas, sometimes you need to work with someone like a therapist, someone who can help you really explore your, your nervous system's reaction to trauma. A lot of us who do coaching are um, trauma informed. I am myself because I do study with layoff and I work with people who are laid off. So we do a lot of work that has to do with re-regulating the nervous system because your body carries pain. Like let's not, let's make no mistake. Um, Again, if we spend most of our life in this context and we have been hurt by this context, it will leave scar, I call it scar tissue. It'll leave scar tissue literally in your nervous system um, and emotionally with you. So some of that's just, there's healing work that has to be done. Um, and that again, can come through working with a skilled therapist or coach. It can go through being, you know, there's lots of career groups. Someone asked if I run groups, I do run groups. I'm not doing one right now. I'll probably do one in the fall. Um, 
But I think that alone, there's something about normalizing the experience that people have with bad work that is deeply restorative and healing. Um, I go back to investing in yourself, like treating yourself tenderly and kindly and from a place of joy with things that you do. And if there's a perception that like, if work's not going well, then I just should work harder. Like I should just put my head down and put more in and put more on someone's <laughs> nodding emphatically at me right now. Like the sense that like, I'm just not working hard enough. And I, I actually often invite people to say like, let's, there's a great tool called the wheel of life, um, which you can just Google. And there's a, probably a dozen versions of it. It's a coaching tool. A lot of us use, and it offers at least eight domains of our lives, work, money, family, health, uh, hobbies, community, spirituality, whatever it is, the different versions are, are available online. I might often say if one of the ways to overcome terrible work is to right size the role of work in your life, to use a language I used before, it's like do something that's not work related all the time and challenge the belief that you have, which a lot of us carry that something's wrong with me. If that didn't work out, if I'm not happy, if I can't get happy in this place, that it means I'm broken, um, you know, not to, not to sound like a commercial. I mean, this is why coaching is such a gift. So if you can engage somebody to help you think it through and to put your life back into proportion and to give yourself a chance to set goals again for yourself and begin again, you know, it's a long life, God willing, it's a long life. And we have the opportunity to reset if things aren't working. Um, but it's like, my mom used to say like, don't throw bad money after bad money. I kind of feel that way about our careers. Like if it's, if you feel like garbage and it's not, it's not, you're not making beautiful music together. Let's stop and think about whether you're in the right relationship. We got a question here from Michael saying, I'm still working, but would like to start networking. Yeah. How do I start? And I'm going to take it a step further. How do you start under conditions like we're living in now, yeah. which are incredibly unique? Yeah, I actually think this is a great time to network. I think people have been um, unbelievably gracious and helpful these days. I would start, you know what, you, you guys asked this. I'd start by looking around this screen right now. And you guys, I mean, at the, my old B-School hat is on. Like there might be people on this on the, there's a couple of screens here who you haven't talked to in a while, who you don't know, you come across, maybe you're in the same class, maybe you weren't. Um, I'd start by looking at Janet just came on screen for this moment, right? Um, I'd start by thinking about your business school. You're like, it's like your home base, right? Like I think about my college and my graduate schools as my home base. I always start there. Um, I would start, and again, I use these ideas of, I didn't finish the metaphor of the ring of the tree. I think about your network, the ancient, most, the smallest rings are the people who already want to hear from you, even if you worked with them five years ago, like I worked with my friend, Janet Rosbach, and we don't see each other all the time anymore because we don't work together anymore. But, you know, we make, we have a phone call once every 18 months and there's so much affection and goodwill that I'm like, of course I'll pick up the phone for her. Of course she'll pick up the phone for you. I like to make lists. So if you feel like you have nowhere to begin, I'm like, name three people who you'd love to reconnect with from the last job you had. Name three people who you went to business school with, who you enjoyed terribly and have lost touch with. Start there. Start with the people who, with whom you have affection and goodwill and build the muscle. The thing I will say is know what you want. If you just want to reconnect, make sure that's in the email. If there's no agenda, simply want to reconnect. If it is, I'm trying to relocate to Boston and you're based in Boston, or I'm thinking about coming into healthcare, and I know you spent most of your career there and I'm, I'm trying to figure out the pivot let them know how they can help you, what your purpose is in outreach, but, you know, start with the wins. Like, why not? So that's what I would say. And welcome to Janet Rossback, who is our alumni relations director here at Baruch, who has joined us. Welcome, Janet. I have put in the chat the link for everyone to RSVP for our next session with Nyla, which will be in May. Um, this is going to be a deeper dive session that will allow for more interactivity between yourselves with each other and as well as with Nyla. So definitely check that out if you're interested. Are there any other questions um, before we wrap up for this evening? This has been a wonderful session, Nyla. I've really enjoyed Thank it. You. And yeah, I'd be happy if you guys want to pop off um, mute too, if that's better than putting it in writing. Um, but, you know, the thing I will say is like, I know from personal experience and from studying these people, there is a path forward. Like if work feels like garbage, doesn't feel like it's enough, if you feel like it's misaligned or you've outgrown it, which I think is, it's deeply familiar to me. You know, I just, it was, we were making, I always use relationship um, 
metaphor is like we were making beautiful music together for a really long time and suddenly the fire was gone and I could not reignite the fire. It was not coming back. Um, there is, the world is wide and vast and you are talented and your experiences are robust and rich and you owe it to yourself to excavate your work history, to excavate your desires and to go in search of something that's better for you. Um, yeah, shine a spotlight on your contributions. Let's do it. I'm so excited for you guys and pull down that worksheet and play with it. And like, let me know how it goes because um, that is the pathway to, to choice in my opinion. It really is. Thank you to everyone leaving these kind messages. Oh, uh, so great so that much. you enjoyed this. Um, I am going to share the, uh, in our follow-up email, I'll share the link to the worksheet again, as well as a recording of this and the RSVP link for our next session in May. Hope to see many of you there. Um, and this has been a really great session. Thank you so oh, much to so our much. alumni Thank for being guys. here. Thank you for having Thank me. You, Nyla. Thank you very much, Nyla. I hope everyone has a great rest of your evening uh, and hope to see you again soon in another alumni event. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great night. Take care. Thank you. Oh, Thank you, Nyla. Oh, hey, Janet, how are you? Good, thank you so much. Your wisdom is so valuable. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. How are you? Where are you? Upstate New York? I'm upstate New York. I've jumped between three events tonight and uh, we're all talking about the same thing, about making the most of our time and ourselves, our talents, and um, and being kind to ourselves. Yeah. So uh, that's that's what we need to do these days. I know. And hopefully, yeah. you know, when everyone talks about like, can't wait to go back. I'm like, I don't know, man. There are a lot of things we've learned. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to hustle. I don't want to go back to self-punishment. I don't want to go back to being on my own case all the time. No, thank you. <laughs> you were or... event hopping tonight, Janet. You were all over, all over Zoom. Were I was you? all over Zoom. It's true. But you um, events in the same night. Yeah. Uh, three different populations. So, um, Greg, I don't know if you want to stop the recording. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs>